This program is brought to you by NewsWorks in cooperation with Eau Claire County. This program is simulcast on WRFPLP 101.9. I call to order this regular meeting of the Eau Claire County Board of Supervisors on this Wednesday, April the 3rd. Uh, members, supervisors, um, please rise for honoring the flag and a moment of reflection by Supervisor Mowry. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Is it on? Oh, it's on. Okay. Um, I, I titled this, pr this uh, reflection, Sleepwalking Towards the Edge of a Cliff. When I was growing up a few decades ago, it seems like there was a lot of faith and trust placed in science. Today we seem to have trouble determining what is truth and what is unscientific, unsupported claim. Recently, the World Wild Wildlife Fund's Living Planet Index reported that there has been a 60% decline of mammals, birds, fish, and reptiles since 1970, with most of the decline attributed to human activity. Mike Barrett, Executive Director of Science and Conservation at the World Wildlife Fund, remarked that if there was a 60% decline in the human population, that would be the equivalent to emptying North America, South America, Africa, Europe, China, and Oceania. He also stated that we are sleepwalking towards the edge of a cliff. Human activities have caused this decline through the destruction of wildlife habitats, mass killing of animals for food, and the impact of a rapidly warming climate. Some scientists warn that we are dangerously close to a sixth mass extinction event caused by a single species, humans. One thing is real, and it is supported by a vast majority of climate scientists, and that is our climate is warming. As a boy in Nebraska, I could average, expect on average about four days of 90 degree or higher temperatures. Today, that number is seven days, but by the end of this century, projections say it could be between 50 and 88 days. The warmest five years were the last five years, and 18 of the 19 warmest years have occurred since 2001. Weather events in 2017 cost the U.S. $306 billion. I will not live that much longer, so maybe I could continue sleepwalking and not be greatly impacted by climate change. In March of this year, students across the world protested by not attending school, inspired by the example of Greta Thunberg, a 16-year-old Swedish student who walked out of school to protest the lack of concern for her future on the part of adults. Greta is reported to be prone to depression, and she did not even like to speak up in class. But after learning about climate change, species decline and extinction, and humans' impact on climate, she was determined to protest publicly and regularly. I'm hearing terms as an adult today that I've never heard as a boy, such as polar vortex, bomb cyclones, super hurricanes, king tides, bleaching coral reefs, thawing permafrost, shrinking gl glaciers, disappearing Arctic ice, melting polar caps, and human climate change refugees. It is not easy to explain these phenomena to children, let alone answer their question of why am I, as an adult, not doing something to combat these threats to the well-being of future generations. The 2018 special report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change predicts disastrous and irreversible consequences for our ecosystems, which would severely impact our well-being if average global warming is not contained between contained below 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels. The goal is to re reduce greenhouse gas emissions to net zero levels as soon as possible and at least by 2050. The World Economic Forum has identified climate change as the single great greatest threat to global stability because, because of its manifold consequences for health and stability of developing nations. Climate change migration is real, and it is impacting the poor and mostly blameless populations of the world. This body will have a chance to pass a resolution to establish goals of 100% renewable energy and carbon neutrality by the year 2050 for Eau Claire County. I encourage us to wake up, acknowledge the cliff we are walking towards, and to act to preserve 
our planet for coming generations. Don't just take my word for this. A week from today, please consider listening to the message of Dr. Catherine Hayhoe from Texas Tech University, and she's also the director of the university's Climate Science Center, who is a highly accomplished climate scientist, prolific publisher, and leading communicator on the topic of human impact on our environment. Wednesday, April 10th, 7.30 p.m., Schofield Auditorium, tickets online, and I was not paid to, to give this message. Thank you. Tonight's meeting will be broadcast on Valley Media Works, Charter Channel 994, on Thursday at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. following the meeting, WFRPLP 101.9 FM, and online at valleymediaworks.org. The next item on our agenda is the approval of, oh, sorry, call the roll, sorry, thank you. That's a good thing Janet's here. <laughs> call the roll, supervisors, please take your keypads in hand, indicate your presence. Supervisor Anton, there you go. <laughs> Sorry. We have 27 members present. We do have a quorum. Now the next item on our agenda is approval of the Journal of Proceedings of March 19th. Your agenda says 17th. Should be the 19th. A motion by Supervisor Beckfield, a second by Supervisor Bates. Is there, are there any additions, deletions, corrections to the Journal of Proceedings? We'll do this by voice vote. All those in favor of approving the, the journal proceedings indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed by nay. It is unanimous. Thank you very much. The next item on our agenda is public comment. We have one person who has asked to speak. Mr. Richard Johnston, would you come forward, please? Yes. Please identify yourself. <coughs> Yes, my name is Richard Johnston. Um, I live here in Eau Claire, the city of Eau Claire. <clears throat> Do you need anything else? No. Okay. <laughs> Whatever your comment is. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, I just learned about one item on your agenda uh, from Don Maori that is involved uh, non-metallic mining in the vicinity of the Highway 85 um, wayside. And uh, it's a proposal for mining. And the reason I'm here, I'm uh, representing the Friends of the Chippewa River State Trail. And the State Trail runs right through that. Uh, the, the mining will, would occur on both sides of the Chippewa River State Trail. <clears throat> so our group has some concerns that we just wanted to raise to you folks tonight so that you would take that into consideration as you look at this proposal. Uh, the first is, of course, safety, safety of riders uh, and walkers on the trail. This is a very um, kind of a nice natural area. People are used to peace and quiet and tranquility as they walk on the trail. And now they may be uh, forced to encounter huge machines, big trucks full of gravel. Um, and we just want to make sure safety is is a first concern, probably with signage, like signage on the trail and signage uh, stop signs for the uh, <clears throat> the trucks to stop before they proceed across the trail. Um, our next concern would be for the integrity of the trail, that the trail doesn't get ruined by the machinery. I believe that will be taken care of. This probably isn't uh, a terrible concern. But last and probably the greatest would be that the uh, integrity of the trail is maintained, that there's kind of a natural barrier between what's occurring with the mining and the trail itself, so that people feel safe and protected as they walk and bicycle along the trail. Probably that there's a, a vegetative barrier between the trail and the, the mining and that uh, if there are trees, that those trees would be maintained and that um, there would be vegetation 
to uh, kind of absorb the sound and hopefully mask some of the, uh, the visual impact of the mining. So to be honest, we are not happy that this is going to occur, but if it does, we just want to make sure that the uh, trail is maintained and that the uh, integrity of uh, being able to use the trail safely is, is taken care of. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other member of the public who wishes to present a comment tonight? Please come forward, sir. So that we can record this, uh, please provide your name for the clerk. Arvid, A-R-V-I-D, Jerezik, J-E-R-E-C-Z-E-K. I'm the owner of the pet. Of the? Of the mine down there. Oh, please. Okay, so to address his concerns, we already met with the DNR. We so to address the concerns, we already talked to the DNR. We already put a concrete area where the bike trail is. We took out the, the layer of blacktop that was there and put a concrete crossing in there. We have to put stop signs up each way, and then we're going to put signs each way to warn bicyclers that there will be heavy trucks going across there. And then um, there's 55 feet of barrier on each side of the bike trail that's grass and tree to ready. So I think that's, that should be okay, I think. Any other questions for no, me? We could, I'm sorry, it's just a comment. There's no okay. question period here. All right. Thank you for your Thank comment. Thank you. Is there any other member of the public who wishes to comment? Mm -hmm. Thank you. We will now move to uh, the sixth item on our agenda, reports to the county board under 2.04.320. First is an oral report on a Title 18 Comprehensive Zoning Update by MSA Professional Services. Mr. Jason Valerius is here to present. All right, hello. Uh, good evening. Um, <clears throat> so again, my name is Jason Valerius. I'm a, a planning consultant with MSA Professional Services and uh, here tonight to uh, kind of bring you up to speed on the update to Title 18, the zoning and subdivision ordinance for the county. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, so I'll kind of walk you through um, what's happening, what's supposed to be happening, and give you some details about where we're at right now, specifically about changes that we're anticipating in the ordinance. So uh, this project started uh, late last year, and, and the purpose of this project uh, first is to make your uh, zoning and subdivision ordinance consistent with current law, uh, with case law uh, changes that have occurred uh, since it was adopted, uh, and in some cases just bringing it up to date with best practice in, in planning and land, land use regulation. Um, the, uh, your planning development uh, staff have been working over the past uh, couple of years really to uh, collect uh, ideas of their own about things that need to be updated and also uh, to uh, develop a committee. Uh, is there an issue hearing me? Do I need to just get a little closer to it? Okay. Um, uh, so uh, staff organized uh, what they've what they're calling the oversight committee, and then a number of subcommittees to look at specific uh, use types in the county and get some feedback from people who are affected by the zoning ordinance. So uh, agricultural uses, uh, commercial uses, residential uses, and uh, so. Uh, the update will be looking to address some, some problems and needs that have been identified by stakeholders. Um, and then uh, this is really the first comprehensive update of the ordinance in decades. And uh, it's time to bring the code into, uh, into current best practice in terms of just how it's organized. And so uh, this update will, should make the ordinance easier to use for everyone. So uh, that's the purpose. I would note that the, uh, you have nine towns that, uh, that use your zoning ordinance, that have adopted the zoning ordinance and are, and are uh, county zoned. Um, 
and so uh, this only affects the zoning the zoning ordinance portion only really affects them but title 18 also includes portions that affect all of the towns um, including especially the subdivision ordinance so all of the towns are subject to the subdivision ordinance and will be affected by any changes uh, that we make um, with respect to the sub with the zoning ordinance each of the towns uh, will need uh, because this is a comprehensive update, each of the towns that uses it will need to adopt the new ordinance uh, uh, individually uh, to be able to use it within a year after it's adopted by the county. So uh, we're not really talking about a few changes here and there. We're talking about an entire repeal and replace of the ordinance because um, while none of the changes that, that I'm going to do a quick overview of tonight are really uh, earth earth shaking uh, there are quite a few small changes so um, uh, it's really a comprehensive uh, cleanup uh, with with policy changes here and there um, in terms of schedule like I said we started late last year we had uh, a, a series of kickoff meetings in December and uh, we've been working since then to do our own analysis of the code and I'm going to spend a few minutes tonight to tell you about that analysis to explain the likely changes. Um, we have a, some meetings scheduled coming up here in April, on April 25th, uh, with uh, all of the towns that are town zoned. Um, we're, we've organized that into two different meetings. Where we've asked each of the towns to attend one of those meetings on the evening of April 25th at the town of Washington Town Hall. Um, we're also working with staff to set up a public meeting uh, that will be sometime in May. We're still nailing down that date. That also we've decided we're going to host at the Washington Town Hall, and um, that'll be an opportunity for anyone and everyone to learn more about this process, how it might affect them, and, and share comments with us. Um, at any time, uh, any of you or anyone in the public uh, can reach out to offer comments to ask questions. Jared Grande is the uh, staff lead for this project and really your main point of contact on this project. Uh, so uh, just a little bit more about the schedule. Uh, we'll be headed then into the summer doing the heavy work of actually making all the changes and, and really writing, writing a new version of the code. And it'll be this next fall then that we'll be coming around and doing a series of meetings to tell everyone and show everyone that updated code and seek feedback on that. Um, our objective is to uh, get to public hearing in uh, March of next year and uh, almost exactly a year from now be in front of you asking for adoption of the revised code. Um, as I said, the towns then have a year after the county adopts it to adopt the code themselves. Until they do, uh, the towns continue to use the current version of the code. If for any reason any of them would, would fail to adopt the new code within a year, uh, they would be op effectively opting out of county zoning uh, unless they meet, make some other arrangement with the county. I don't anticipate that. The relationship here in the, in the use of the, the county zoning ordinance has been a good one by all indications. Uh, it's a cooperative relationship between the towns and the county. So uh, I don't expect that this process is likely to result in any of the towns deciding to uh, back out of uh, collaborating with the county on zoning. Uh, so uh, just to offer you a quick overview of what we have been finding in the code and what we're recommending for changes, uh, the work we'll be doing this summer. Um, I talked about the, the update in structure. Uh, we want to just make the whole ordinance a little bit easier to understand, better organized, put like content in one place instead of kind of distributed throughout. Uh, we're going to use more tables and graphics so that there's less, there are fewer uh, paragraphs of text uh, so that it's just easier to digest and easier to find a regulation when you're looking for it. Uh, the, the table I have up here as an example is uh, what we call the use table. Right now, if you want to know um, whether uh, a use that you want, to, something you want to do on your property is allowable, you go into your zoning district and you read through a list of uses. And the new format will be this grid where we show 
all of the zoning districts and a long list of uses and whether you're looking in your district and you want to read down to see which uses are allowed or not or you know what use you want and you're trying to figure out what would your property need to be zoned to allow that use you can go to your use and look across uh, the, the districts so uh, a, a much more compact and digestible way of, of communicating that information <clears throat> a few changes that we anticipate to the existing zoning districts you have an a1 district that used to be a farmland preservation district it no longer is certified as such we just need to clean that up um, to reflect that fact um, we're going to be uh, likely creating a new residential district specifically intended for use in agricultural areas uh, so that uh, there is a tool by which towns and the county can approve scattered rural residential with a very clear understanding that that residential property uh, you know that that occupant that owner can't complain about about ag happening around them it's intended to preserve agricultural uh, activity um, we're going to be looking at the industrial districts uh, to uh, make a distinction between heavier and lighter industrial uh, so that you can allow industrial in more areas while accepting the really heavy industrial uses. Um, we're going to be adding a planned development district. Uh, and you kind of have that right now, but we're going to be cleaning it up and bringing it into what is the more typical practice for how that happens. Um, and we'll be looking at adding some things like lot coverage and impervious surface limits uh, to the zoning districts. Um, I'm going to take a few more minutes to go through the rest of these. If you want to interrupt me and ask a question, feel free. <clears throat> we uh, are expecting a few changes to the use regulations. Uh, you may be aware that the state changed how conditional uses are treated. Uh, as of um, about a year and a half ago, uh, conditional uses are a little bit less discretionary. Uh, the county uh, board can't just decide whether to approve or not. Uh, it has that decision has to be based on substantial evidence, and so uh, we'll be making sure that the ordinance reflects that 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 new law. Um, we'll be looking at specific uses that haven't really been addressed or well defined by the ordinance and providing for some definition of, of what they are and how they're regulated. Uh, examples of that include um, some, some tweaks to how accessory structures are regulated, uh, an, a, a more clear ordinance to address the keeping of chickens and ducks and maybe a few other animals in residential areas. Uh, looking at short-term rentals, otherwise known as Airbnb, and uh, the regulations on accessory dwelling units, which are an extra dwelling unit attached to what would otherwise be a single-family home. Um, other items, uh, looking at rural tourism, uh, this is a hot topic really um, across the state, across the country, various ways that uh, kind of tourism related activities happen in ag and rural areas and so we'll be kind of reviewing and refining uh, what what's allowed and how it's allowed um, and uh, we'll also be adding a process for how uses that aren't named in that long list uh, can be added if something new comes forward uh, development standards excuse me yes Sup supervisor Bates thank you uh, I'm wondering, as you transform ag land into residential land, will there be standards that give consideration to land that is really agriculturally suitable in that process so we don't turn our best ag land into residential? Yeah, and I think you've you've got a lot of that already. So it's it's worth pointing out that uh, the zoning and the comprehensive plans work together. And so the question of sh should land be rezoned to another use, uh, in many cases, that policy lives in the comprehensive plan. And the and the comprehensive plans, uh, uh, both the county and the town plans. Um, I happen to be involved in, in creating many of those town plans and the county plan. They, they, they have that language saying that our intent is for the productive ag land to stay in productivity and to be able to direct uh, it scattered residential uses where we wish to allow them to the less productive lands. 
So uh, just a few more items. We're going to be looking at the landscaping requirements and making a few improvements uh, to that, landscaping, screening, and buffering. Um, we're going to be looking at signage, uh, some, in some cases because we have to, because uh, signage regulations can't address the question of what content is on the signs. The Supreme Court has made that clear, so we'll be cleaning that up. Um, and looking at lighting, both for signs and more generally uh, exterior lighting for uh, primarily commercial and industrial development. Um, the subdivision ordinance, uh, we, yes. Yeah. Supervisor Moritz. Yes. In relation to lighting, is there a thought on dark skies? The uh, lighting ordinance would, would absolutely, uh, should reference dark sky standards and full cutoff fixtures. So that would be the, 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 kind of the baseline that expectation. That I'm, I'm not certain that it is, but I expect that it will be. Supervisor Anton. Question on the uh, extent to which light pollution occurs or is allowed to occur uh, beyond the intended location. Sometimes it gets out and bothers people because it's yeah, so I would make a distinction between light pollution, which I could be more generalized as sky glow because there's just a lot of light, and light trespass, which is light that is directly affecting a neighboring property owner. And I'd say that's the thing that we're primarily interested in adding to the ordinance, where there's a, a lumen standard for how much light is crossing the property line, especially in instances where a uh, commercial or industrial use is adjoining a residential use. That would tend to have a tighter standard, a lower lumen limit than in some other places. If, if I may, uh, I'm representing uh, several townships, but uh, the city of Augusta as well. And we worked with you folks when we put the original plan in place. Mm -hmm. I didn't see anything with regard to Augusta or Fall Creek. Are you going to uh, admit us to the party, if you will, and to talk about the, uh, the situation as you see it, or is it just going to be the townships? It's just the township. So this, the, the Title 18, um, the zoning and subdivision ordinances are only applicable to the unincorporated areas in the county. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I'm yes. sorry, Supervisor Stelches. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was going to hold my comments until the end, but I guess we've, we're now into interruption mode. So <laughs> uh, going back to the... Uh, rental use of properties, the Airbnb question. Yes. I had a constituent a couple of years ago who was very upset about their neighbor renting out their house, which became kind of a party house. I'd like to understand what the thinking is about what we would do about that. And my second question relates to the conservation subdivisions. It's been my observation that while we've had that in our current ordinance, it seems like in a number of instances, the developments have met the letter of those ordinances, but not really the spirit of them. So, you know, I've seen subdivisions where they've been broken up, where everybody has a quasi larger lot, uh, rather than clustering the houses and then creating separate public space. So could you touch upon where we're headed in both of those points? Yeah, so uh, first with the short-term rentals, the Airbnb, um, we, we haven't really gotten into the, the nitty-gritty of how exactly we're going to change it. We've more so flagged it as something that needs uh, more definition given to it. And so, uh, you know, appreciate hearing, hearing that concern. Um, in, in other places where we've addressed this, uh, e to some extent, what we have to do is conform to uh, state statute on how these short-term rentals are to be regulated, um, which includes um, uh, providing notice to the county clerk. Um, and uh, the thing that I think uh, people would like to see is uh, the ability to know about it beforehand. I mean, that, uh, that's not universal, but, but we, we've certainly seen that elsewhere, that some sort of notification of, of neighbors and the town um, is something that we've, we've seen requested elsewhere. So um, I guess I'd be happy to uh, have a follow-up conversation at another point or, or invite that you share some further thoughts about complaints that you've heard with staff, with Jared, to inform our discussion about how we revise, how, how we create that part of the ordinance. 
uh, with respect to the subdivision ordinance and the uh, conservation subdivision option, uh, it's referenced in your ordinance without actually having a section that well defines what a conservation ordinance is. So I would say you don't really have one right now. Uh, the comp plans say that you should. Uh, there's a reference somewhere in the ordinance to it, but there aren't actually regulations that well define uh, uh, the, the method and the rules for conservation uh, subdivisions. So we intend to add those. Uh, <clears throat> wrapping up my slides, and I can take more questions, uh, the uh, ordinance, the subdivision ordinance currently has standards that define how streets are uh, platted and, and how various public improvements, uh, put some standards on public improvements uh, when development occurs. Uh, case law in the time since your code was adopted have has shifted that and said that the county doesn't really have the right to require uh, certain improvements that then become the town's responsibility to maintain. And so uh, we're going to be stripping quite a bit of that out. Um, and to the extent that, we're, that we leave stuff in, maybe working with the towns uh, to ensure that the town and the county are on the same page about, about what things uh, should stay in. Uh, but in general, if the town doesn't want some, some bit of infrastructure, the county can't require it um, that they end up with it. So uh, that's something that we're going to be we're spending some time on and, and uh, revising. Um, and then finally, a, a kind of a language thing. There's, there's references to lot and zoning lot and parcel, and it's a little confusing, so we'll be looking to clean that up in the ordinance. Um, and then there are, throughout the ordinance, descriptions of how processes are supposed to occur, rezoning, conditional use permit, appeals. We're going to organize all that into one place. So. Thank you. Those are my slides. Other questions? Apparently not. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a question. Oh, uh, sorry, Supervisor Bowery. It's on. It should be. Don't touch that. Yeah, but now it's very good. Okay. Um, you mentioned several times in your presentation that uh, case law has changed, so this ordinance needs to be updated. What about the comprehensive plans that there is, are in alignment with the, the zoning? It's supposed to last through 2030. Does, do those need to be updated too? Are they totally out of date or? So yeah, the question is, you know, I, there's there's two aspects of the comprehensive plan that I want that I want to mention. Okay. First is that we have been looking at the plans for guidance as to things that should happen with the ordinance, um, and then the second question is: Does this ordinance is this ordinance likely to spur people to go back and need to make changes to the plan in any way? Um, for the most part, no. Uh, however, there are a few instances. Um, for example, a question that has been asked um, by uh, some of our participants is if we're making this light industrial category that's intended to enable things like uh, light, uh, you know, like assembly uses that aren't noxious in any way, uh, the question was could that be approved in a place that we have designated right now on our plans for commercial use? And uh, my answer would be that that may be an acceptable outcome, but I wouldn't advise that as a matter of policy that you approve that zoning in a, in a place planned for commercial because you may have planned that commercial with the intent that that's high visibility property that really should be actually commercial. So there's an example of uh, to to be able to make use of some of the new tools that we're providing, a town may decide that it, it needs to update its plan. Uh, finally, I would note that uh, the comprehensive plans are supposed to be updated uh, no less than every 10 years. And I think some, I think the county has been working with towns to, to try to do that. I think some of them are still on the to-do list. Thank you. Thank you. I thank you. Oh, sorry, Supervisor Anton. Thank you. Uh, to what extent does the comprehensive plan uh, intent drive the decision making regarding land use? And uh, is there a legal requirement? Uh, I, I sat in on uh, something a fellow asked me to, to help him and he's in Chippewa uh, County, so it's, it's different. But uh, there seems to be a lot of struggling going on there with regard to this is what the plan says, but this is what is requested and 
what should we do? Uh, could you comment on the uh, reason why we have a plan in the first place and uh, to what extent is it supposed to be followed? Sure. Um, the, uh, the the intent of the statutes, uh, the intent of having the comprehensive planning legislation is that uh, all jurisdictions who regulate land use uh, take time before they're faced with a development proposal to ask this, this series of questions that relate to how should land develop here and, uh, and that that should happen with public input. Um, and that there be a reasonably current assessment of what uses are appropriate where in our jurisdiction. Um, the statutes require that if you regulate land use with a zoning ordinance and with a subdivision ordinance, uh, you have to have a comprehensive plan. And when you make decisions with those, uh, re related to those ordinances, so you rezone property or you divide property, that those decisions by statute have to be consistent with the ordinance. And so if you end up in a situation where something is proposed that doesn't fit with your comprehensive plan, the way the comprehensive plan is written, the statutes require that you first go back and revise the comprehensive plan if you wish to approve that, that zoning or, or land division change. I think that's the final thank you. Other questions? Thank you, Mr. Brewer. Thank you, everyone. The next item on our agenda is uh, juvenile justice update, including secure residential care centers for youth, the SRCCY, and human services legislation overview. Diane Cable from Human Services. And apparently, Mr. Fabius. <laughs> All right, good evening. I almost feel like I should cheer because <laughs> it came to get, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Diane Cable, I'm the Director at Human Services, and Rob Fadness, um, the Juvenile Detention Manager. And um, Catherine asked us to come um, just to give an update with regard to the conversations across the state regarding the closing of Lincoln Hills and Copper Lake and the wonderful um, SRCCCYs, the wonderful acronym of SRCCCYs, which we'll get into talking just a little bit about what that means. Sharing with you our response, Eau Claire County's response to this um, change in legislation and also um, some of the legislative updates that we shared yesterday in Madison as part of the Human Services Day at the Capitol. So the SRCCCY, what that means is essentially are secured residential care centers for children and youth. These came into place with Act 185, um, which um, occurred almost a year ago, which uh, uh, directed the closing of both Lincoln Hills and Copper Lake, and then created the process and the ability for a type one facility for serious juvenile offenders and county operated SRCCCYs. What's important to um, uh, think about with these, uh, this act is that this is pertaining specifically to corrections and not the whole juvenile justice system. This type one facilities, uh, this would be the state run facilities for those youth who meet the criteria for um, serious juvenile offenses. The state then redirected for counties to operate the other um, programs of youth who would be referred to corrections in the county facility. So this is um, just a little um, picture that just shows that we're really talking about just a very tip of the juvenile justice system when we think about the whole juvenile justice system 
Act 185 is just talking about a small percentage of that system. So the major provisions, I'm not going to go through the whole law. The whole um, act talks about a lot of time frames and responsibilities between the Department of Corrections, between counties, establishing a grant committee to be able to help create the rules and um, with regard to the new law, uh, a committee then that would oversee uh, the um, um, uh, counties that submit for becoming an SRCCCY. And also the funding. And so in the initial act, there was $40 million allocated for the building of the SRCCCYs. What we knew is that that wasn't enough money to build several sites of uh, correctional facilities. Um, and so in the current governor's budget, there is an allocation for $100 million for those dollars for the building of the SRCCYs. Once they're built, the operation costs are all on the county for operating and maintaining those facilities. So this is just to give a little glimpse of what those timelines are like. They, um, there's a grant committee that was formed and a committee that also talked about the creation of the emergency rule, of the recommendations for the SRCCCYs, the emergency rule for what those facilities look like when into place. Again, these are focused on correctional facilities. And then they said March 31st, the grant applications were due. Well, by March 31st, the grant committee hadn't given out yet what the grant, the, the RFP for the grants. And so there's been, this was a very aggressive timeline that legislation then was put into place and requested to be able to slow this process down in being able to allow counties to show letters of intent with regard to pursuing SRCCCYs. What you're going to hear from me in, a, in just a minute is that um, uh, areas of the state are very interested in pursuing the SRCCCYs, and some areas of the state are not really are really wondering whether or not we need to move forward with that for every place in the state. So, Eau Claire County, after assessing um, the needs here in the western part of the state. Um, based upon our own residents and those that we serve with our juvenile detention facility, determined that we did not need to move forward in creating and building a new juvenile facility. We didn't feel that we needed to create a correctional facility because we do not serve youth currently in, the, in our facility who would be referred to corrections, and we have no youth in corrections. We also know that there are some areas of the state, the southern area of the state in Milwaukee County, Racine County, Kenosha, perhaps Dane County, they are looking to and have submitted um, letter or have indicated submitting letters of intent to pursue the SRCCCY facilities. And what we've asked then as part of our legislative request um, yesterday with our legislators and through Wisconsin Counties Association is that for the balance of the state, the numbers look really different in terms of the youth who would be referred to corrections. It just is not the same as in the uh, more popular, populous areas of the state for needing that correctional facility. And we've asked to, for that process to just slow down and really assess what is it that we need in this part of the state in response to um, uh, youth who may be referred to corrections. Now, we, I want to remind everybody that we have the ability, because the state will still have a state-run facility for those ju serious juvenile offenders. So that's already in place. We're talking about the next level of youth in terms of what kind of facility they need. So currently, we have um, uh, uh, a declining amount of youth who were even serving within the detention facility, um, actually throughout our region, but also this demonstrates within Eau Claire, in which we are serving more and more of our youth. They're not meeting that threshold of needing that higher level of corrections, and we're serving them in the community 
or through our current long-term program um, in the detention facility. So I'm going to let Rob, just for a moment, kind of talk a little bit about the youth um, within our current facility. <clears throat> okay, so we can piggyback gonna, here. Okay. I'm going to go right here. Okay. Okay, I, I, I really... <clears throat> I want to give a very brief snapshot of uh, the kids that we hold in juvenile detention in Eau Claire County. Um, you'll, you can see from that, that slide there that Eau Claire County's placements <clears throat> are going down. Uh, overall placements are going down. But the interesting thing is, and, and if you don't know the entire picture, you'll look at it and go, well, yeah, other counties are really going up. But in reality, other counties' crimes are not going up. Other counties are making placements in secure detention because they don't have any other place to put their kids. So that point aside, um, these are literally going to be uh, quick hitters. Uh, we still hold uh, annually up to 23 counties uh, in secure detention. Uh, we've gone as high as 40. So when we talk about Eau Claire County and Northwest Regional Juvenile Detention, we are literally talking about almost the western part of the state from La Crosse North. About 60% of the kids, 70 or 70% 70 of the kids that we have are white. Um, that, that should not be a surprise. 70% um, are female. Um, the vast majority are, or an average, uh, average age at admission is 15. 16, excuse me. I can't see without my glasses. 16 years old. Uh, nope, I believe 70% are male. 70% male, I'm sorry, 70% male, 30% female, and, and that, that's literally been consistent for 30 years since we've been open. And the age, you said the average age is 16. Um, when is the youngest you accept? Uh, 10. 10 to 17. Interestingly, which I do think is important, is that the vast majority of placements that we get uh, in the detention center from everybody are for 72-hour holds. And 72-hour holds are the juvenile equivalent of an adult probation hold. Um, it's a technical violation of a court-ordered condition. So you're adjudicated delinquent and then you skip school, you could in theory go to secure detention for three days. Run away, three days, etc. Okay? It's not what you would consider when you talk about SRCCCYs and the Department of Corrections. It's technical violations for violating your court ordered supervision. Not even, quite honestly, not even most of them are, are uh, not even new crimes. Most of the crimes that kids commit as a process of going to detention are property crimes. You would think they would be sex crimes, violent crimes, crimes against persons. They're property crimes. Breaking and entering. Uh, going into people's garages, breaking into their cars, and not to minimize the fact that th these are crimes and that obviously they cause uh, a great deal of disruption in people's lives, but um, you could argue that that may not be rise to the level of a, a danger to another person. Uh, the interesting thing, and I only have two more, two more pieces, the interesting thing, which I think is, is significant, um, is our mental health issues. In 2017, um, 
all the kids that come in are given a, a self-harm and a suicide risk screen. And in 2017, the total score for everybody, or the total average score, was 16.6%. In 2018, it was 25.3. So that's suicide and self-harm. Okay, that's significant. And the other piece that goes along with that, in 2017, we had the highest number of self-harm incidents that we've ever had in detention, eight. In 2018, we had 27. In 2017, I'm sorry, yep, 2017, our total injuries, I, I, I hesitate to say suicide um, because, uh, you know, we, we have not had a successful suicide in detention. So if someone uh, makes an effort to commit suicide, and fails, then it becomes a question of intent. And was, was there intent to actually end their life, or was there intent for, to get attention, to get released from secure detention and placed in a hospital, and so on? I don't know. I won't make that judgment. But self-harms, suicide attempts, et cetera, um, our highest ever was in 2017, and that's all total 28 incidents. Um, and in 2018, we had 55. And the last part is, uh, let's see, chapter 51s. Um, last year, we had 11, 11 actual uh, commitments to Sacred Heart and then on to Winnebago. Um, for a period of time, all due to incidents of self-harm and or suicide. Now, these aren't indicative of anything other than a kid's need and a cry for help. And they're not going to successfully be addressed in corrections. They won't successfully be addressed in um, an SRCCCY. My last comment. The average kid, if you talk about the kid that goes to the SRCCY, a kid that is placed or committed to the Department of Corrections and is go, goes to a long-term secure holding facility, you're typically not talking about Eau Claire County's average juvenile in secure detention. And the average is a white 16-year-old male placed for three days for a violation of their conditions of supervision for a property crime. That's the kind of kid we have in detention. Those kids don't need to uh, be placed in Department of Corrections or SRCCYs. Anybody have any questions on that? Yeah. Are you still doing the 180-day program? Yes. And so the numbers that we saw, does that include, it does not include your 180-day program? No, I, I have uh, separate numbers. It, it actually gets very interestingly convoluted because our, our placements have, not ours, but overall in detention placements have, um, the lengths have just exceeded 20 some days um, for the average kid, um, where it used to be five to 10. Because, uh, again, there's, there's not really a clear place to put some of these uh, types of individuals. And then just to follow up, um, seeing the rise in mental health um, concerns, is there someone who comes in, some mental health professional who spends time in SECURE to work with any of the individuals in a one-on-one -on -one setting? Uh, no, and and it's there, there's a lot of different things that factor into that. Um, quite honestly, kids that are initially placed there with with those significant mental health issues, the intent is not to keep them there for an extended period of time. 
you know, the, the intent is to keep them there until they can find a placement, which is a difficult chore at best. Um, what happens then is we don't get therapists to come in detention, and I think that that may be a, a billing issue or a clerical issue or something, so people don't come to detention. We will occasionally, actually regularly bring kids outside to other therapists, but then it's a matter of getting a new person in to see a new therapist, scheduling, and so on. We, we probably transport two to three kids a day to see therapists on our own, um, so we're not certainly not against it. It's just a logistical thing. So I'm going to respond just a little bit more to that because yeah. it is Let me slide out. Um, evolving. Yes. And um, as you all know, juvenile detention, which is a jail for youth, is not the place for kids with mental health issues. And there is a trend in which our neighboring counties have said to us, as, as Rob said, people, counties are starting to use the facility, finding ways to justify using the facility because they don't have another place for youth to go. Now that our clinic is open, we are talking about how we can serve. We have crisis who go up and our crisis staff go up and respond and looking at how we can start to link our behavioral health services within human services within the detention facility. It still is not the right place. We're talking, the, the staff do a phenomenal job in helping to address, but, but you can't get away with the fact that doors slam lock. This is not, those kids are horribly traumatized coming in and they continue to receive that trauma while they're in the facilities. What we know is that we do not have the numbers for this kind of facility for us uh, to need an SRCCCY. But we do need something. And so what we are recommending is to have the process kind of slow down, have Wisconsin start to say, what is your vision for responding to youth in the correctional system and the youth justice system? And how we be able to create crisis stabilization, which would be a better way of being able to respond to our youth. That doesn't mean we still will need, and we're grandfathered in. Let's see if I can, oh, there we go. So we are one of 13 juvenile detention facilities. We are grandfathered in to continue to run our facility. We, Eau Claire and this area, needs to have a short-term detention facility for those short-term stays for youth when um, you're waiting for court or uh, some sort of hold that needs to occur in response to an incident for protection of the community, for protection of those youth. And our long-term program. And so we're assessing what are some good ways to continue to operate our long-term 180-day um, program within that um, detention facility and engaging within the community. We truly believe that that's the best way to respond to our youth um, within our um, Stepping Up initiative and as being a trauma-informed organization. Supervisor Borboom, did you wish to? Yeah, speak? I guess you kind of partially answered it, but um, what are alternative placements for kids who... Um, like are on a 72 hour hold or, you know, if, if, if other counties are full with, like what does that look like if they are full and coming here? So if a youth, um, so, so if a youth violates their court order, there are a lot of different ways the intake worker or the social worker can respond to that. Sometimes they've, they've already done many different types of responses of working with that youth, and a 72-hour hold is one way of doing that. So we, um, uh, social workers and staff, look at a variety of different options and resources to be able to respond, um, whether or not it is the use of um, uh, uh, services within the home or within the community or, um, or another facility. It, Thank you. It, it can actually be any of the array of placements that, that are uh, involved with a temporary physical custody request period. So it could be sending uh, the youth home, foster home, group home, secure detention, shelter care, any one of those things that either are A, available 
um, and be appropriate for that placement. Okay. Supervisor Anton. To what extent do you believe the people that don't get the service might well go on and become adult delinquents, if you will, enter our system and incarceration and the rest and all the rest of it? Uh, are, how big is that problem? Uh, because I expect we're not adequately, in, in every respect, addressing the needs of the people with mental health when they're used. And should we be doing that? Is that, from a money standpoint? Yes. <laughs> yes is the short answer to that to that question. Um, we are working to, and we I've shared this with many of you, working to begin interventions and at a much earlier stage with folks. Um, we currently have a, a program called SPARK that is doing community diversion with, with uh, youth who are adjudicated delinquents. And we're already seeing that we are having less placements in jail, uh, kids being really successful in returning to school um, and graduating from school. Uh, it is better for us to engage with those youth and their family earlier on. Now, um, in terms of uh, the adults and who are in jail, who are currently, uh, how, what's that percentage of those youth, who, or adults, excuse me, who have been involved in the um, child welfare or juvenile justice system? Um, there's a national statistic that says that um, over 80% of those who are in our jails or prisons have been in foster care, in the foster care system. Um, I don't have the one off the top of my head of those who have, were in the juvenile justice system, but it's pretty high. It's really significant. We have an opportunity to be able to intervene earlier, and we need to do that earlier. And that's what we're working on, and that's why we really believe that with the, um, this new design of closing Lincoln Hills and Copper Lake, the state will continue to maintain responsibility for those very serious juvenile offenders. And we're talking about, you know, those offenses that are of harm to people um, from a physical harm perspective. There is a place for those youth, heaven forbid something happens, that we're able to refer to. The rest of um, um, youth who maybe commit a crime, we're not seeing that we're having to request youth to go into the correction system. And what we are seeing is the out the outcomes of behaviors through sometimes delinquent acts and which really are manifesting as trauma and mental health issues and which we are addressing in other ways. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Supervisor Pagonis. Um, it's not a question. It's just a shout out to Rob and staff. Um, it was a very difficult child up there for quite a bit of time. She was recently moved to Winnebago. Um, the, the staff just did a, a wonderful job. I did a shout out for Rob to Judge Cray to tell him what a great job they were doing. So I just want to say they have really um, gone beyond what they need to do in terms of working with some of the youth. And in this particular case, they really did an awesome job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I do have a couple legislative updates to share. Uh, um, and uh, yesterday was Human Services Day at the Capitol. Um, both um, Supervisor Diamond and Supervisor Bates joined us to um, talk with our representatives and senators in, and their staff uh, at the Capitol on the items. And so just want to kind of inform you, if you want more information with regard to this, you could reach out to your co-supervisors or certainly contact me. And this was put together through the Wisconsin Counties Association, and on their website is all this information also. So we've been talking about the youth justice, and just to let you know, we are requesting support for the governor to fund those SRCCCYs. It is important for the southern part of the state, Milwaukee and Racine and Kenosha, to be able to have those facilities and have those youth closer to them, and for them to be able to um, change the, the time frames in the legislation to slow this process down for the rest of the state. There also is the initiative in the governor's budget to be able to fund some sufficient funding for the 17-year-olds to come back into the juvenile justice system. 
This is a policy change that everyone has been supportive of, and it really has come down to be able to fund and su support being able to have the 17-year-olds come in. And so we continue to ask the legislators to be able to support this policy change of the some sufficient funding to support those 17-year-olds. With regard to children and families, um, the, we, I've talked about this before, the ch children and families AIDS allocation is, has not increased for many, many, many years, with exception of a few small increases to um, the, cover the costs of, of um, placements, provider placements, placements for children for the providers. Um, and so the request is it's sorely underfunded and counties are spending much, much more money in this area than the state has been supporting. So the request was $30 million for, to increase the children, youth, and family allocation. The governor's budget says $15 million. The request is for the legislature to find the additional $15 million to support this. What I can tell you is this does not cover the cost. It's not just the money, and so it's also the, we've also are working with our state partners in then how we are addressing and to be able to really focus on earlier intervention and prevention services with children and family. And part of that also then is legislative oversight. We should be asking our legislature to have a report, not just from the Bureau of Milwaukee, the state, on how child welfare is occurring there, what's happening with our vulnerable children and how we're taking care of them, but it should be reflective of the whole state. Let's see here. Um, in income maintenance, there is the, um, um, in the current uh, uh, law and then um, uh, uh, the governor's recommendation of expanding Medicaid, both areas talk about expansion of work without any additional dollars to counties. What I'll tell you is our Great Rivers Consortium, which we are the lead county for, we serve 10 counties. We are incredibly efficient. Our timeliness, we've won an award for um, more than once in which we are responding to people within two to three minutes. That does not happen anyplace else in the state. So when people are calling, they're getting connected and they're getting their answers and assistance needed. Additional um, duties and mandates to be able, regardless of how good they are, is additional work. And the request is, is that we need to be able to be funded as counties to be able to support that as consortium. In mental health, and this is the, all of these issues interconnect here. In the mental health area, we're asking for the governor, for the legislature to support the governor's request for a really focus on the expansion of crisis services. This is an area in which, with this expansion and, of, and increase in um, both the state and federal share, will allow us to expand how we respond to our most vulnerable, including the youth we're just talking about. In the, in the detention facility. There's also the talk about the creation of crisis stabilization centers and also um, crisis and program enhancements through different grants. The legislative update for children's long-term care in the last biennium budget, the governor, the budget said to eliminate the children's long-term care wait list. Children who, children who have long-term care needs should not have to wait. We all know that, we do not want them to wait. Unfortunately, it was not funded for be counties to be able to get rid of their wait lists. In Eau Claire County, we still have a wait list. This then is to support the governor's process to be able to eliminate that wait list and then to be able to ask for us to come together with the state and partners and parents and advocates and providers to talk about what are better operational processes to occur for responding and supporting those children and their families. In summary, Eau Claire County, we're, you know this, we're evolving, we're developing, we're responding, we're focused on connections, we're fo focused on best practices, earlier interventions throughout all of what we do, through our operations, our budgeting, and our structure. Our vision is family connections are always preserved and strengthened. Thank you for your time. At any time, don't hesitate to call if you have questions. Supervisor Russell, did I pass over your request? Um, uh, that's okay. You answered my question. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. You're welcome. The next item on our agenda is 
presentation of petitions, claims, and communications, beginning with proclamation, which will be read by our clerk. A proclamation proclaiming the week of April 8th through April 12th, 2019, as Work yes. Zone Awareness Week in Oak Park County, whereas the Wisconsin County Highway Association is asking all 72 counties in the state to unite and kick off Work Zone, work zone Safety Awareness Week with a resolution and campaign to raise awareness for its workers, the traveling public, public safety workers, and those various highway contractors performing work for the counties. And, whereas, construction and maintenance activities on our streets and highways periodically require the work zones be established, and, whereas, there have been over 2,000 work zone crashes in Wisconsin in each of the last three years. And, whereas, in 2018, Wisconsin suffered from nearly 3,100 crashes in road construction and maintenance zones, resulting in over 1,200 injuries and nine fatalities. And whereas, between 2014 and 2018, there were 50 fatalities recorded as a result of crashes in Wisconsin work zones, including three Wisconsin County Highway workers, which were killed while working in work zones. And whereas, in 2017, Eau Claire County experienced a work zone crash on State Highway 27 when a motorist struck one of our equipment operators while sweeping the road's surface during a maintenance operation. And whereas, through their enforcement activities and other participation, the Eau Claire County Sheriff's Office, Wisconsin State Patrol, and Eau Claire County Highway Department are committed to working together in 2019 to make Work Zone Awareness Week a success. Whereas, the Federal Highway Administration has designated April 8th through April 12th, 2019 as National Work Zone Awareness Week. Now therefore, Chair Smyer of Eau Claire County Board of Supervisors does proclaim April 8th through April 12th, 2019 as Work Zone Awareness Week in Eau Claire County. Motion. Supervisor Beckfield. Second, Supervisor Jansen. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor of, of the proclamation indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed by nay, it is unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, the clerk has, I believe, two announcements. On your desk is a blue sheet, and it's just uh, how your information should be uh, put in the official directory for next year. So if nothing changed, just put same on the side and leave it at your desk, and I'll pick it up later. Uh, the other thing is Supervisor Gatlin has a sign-up sheet for moment of reflection for the next uh, session year of the county board. If you'd like to... Do the moment of production, please sign. Thank you. And I believe Supervisor Gatlin has another announcement. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The annual Women's Business Conference will be May 16th, sponsored by the Women's Business Center, one of several programming operations off offered by Western Dairyland Economic Opportunity Council. Um, early bird registration fee is $69 before May 1. Um, if you know somebody that wants to attend and has a... Um, not able to afford the registration, there is scholarships for people who um, are economically distressed. A uh, full lineup of great speakers for uh, anybody who's in small business or wants to improve on their small business or start a small business. It's a really fun event all day at the Davy Center on UWC campus on um, May 16th. If anybody has any questions, they can let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next item on our agenda is first reading of ordinances by committees, beginning with file number 107. This ordinance makes changes to Title 18 zoning in the county code. And you have the list, the complete list on your, your agenda. Uh, this will come back to us in our next meeting. Sorry? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> this is referred to the Committee on Planning and Development, uh, and I assume we'll come back to our next meeting. Couple meetings. Okay. It will come back to us in a future meeting. <laughs> Let's just say that. <laughs> Lest I stumble over myself again. Uh, the next item on our agenda is first reading of ordinances and resolutions by members. And this first file is under my signature. Um, I'll ask the clerk just to announce the file, then I'll talk about how we're handling. Authorizing legislation and matters referred to be carried over to the next legislation session. In order to take up this item, the chair will entertain a motion to suspend the rules. 
motion by Supervisor Bates, second by Supervisor Dunning. Uh, this, uh, this is not a debatable item and it requires a two-thirds vote to suspend the rules. Therefore, supervisors, please take your keypads in hand and vote on the motion to suspend the rules. Supervisor Knight, okay. Um, that is, that's a unanimous 27 votes for, thank you. Uh, that takes us to uh, the motion to adopt this one. We, have, we picked up this motion now. Could we have a motion to adopt? Uh, Supervisor Miller, motion, a uh, second, sorry, Supervisor Gatlin. Uh, so we have a motion to adopt and a second, and now we move to discussion. And I'm going to turn to our corp counsel to explain what we're doing. Um, so toward the end of the uh, legislative session, we have to <coughs> determine whether there's anything that needs to be carried over. Otherwise, uh, anything that has been proposed automatically dies. Um, and anything that is referred uh, at this meeting automatically gets carried over. Um, so uh, what we do is we look at all of the uh, resolutions and ordinances uh, that were sitting out there and to make sure they're either moving through a committee and are going to be adopted at this meeting or referred at this meeting. Um, and this one originally would have actually been taken up tonight, but there's going to be a presentation at the next, next board meeting. So uh, this has been considered by two committees and my understanding is that it'll, whether it comes back at the next board meeting, that's my understanding, but even if it comes back at a, another one, it's carried over into the next legislative session. So that's, that's all this does. It just keeps 1819-111 alive into the next legislative session. Just for clarity's sake, this is the uh, proposal regarding the pedestrian plan for the county. Any discussion, questions? All those in favor of the carryover, please indicate by, uh, on your keypads, sorry. That is 27, uh, uh, yes, that's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, the next item on our agenda is uh, reports of standing committees, committees, commissions, and boards under 2.04.160 and second reading of ordinances. The first item is file number 97. To amend section 9.96.010B and, and create section C of the code purpose to amend section 9.96020 of the code definitions, to amend section 9.96.080A1 of the code license issuance, and to amend section 9.96.090D and G of the code requirements, and to amend section 9.96140B of the code fees. This item is before us tonight for action. So, motion. Supervisor Lavelle. Second. Supervisor Tilson, <laughs> thank you. Uh, discussion, questions? Uh, Supervisor Miller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, some of you will recall about a year and a half ago or so, our committee brought forth what was referred to as the pawnbroker ordinance to mirror what the city had done so that Countywide, we were uniform in how we were approaching the transactions, reporting to the police and sheriff's department and so on and so forth. Uh, very recently, I think back in December, the city modified their ordinance primarily in the reporting system that they had required. Uh, it was something called the automated pawn system. It was a special electronic thing. And now they've changed it so that people can just do electronic reporting to the, well, in their case, the police department, we'd have it to the sheriff's department. Uh, and it wouldn't take necessarily a specific program and whatever. Uh, the other real modification was rather than charging for each transaction or each report, they'd just go to a, a lump fee per quarter basis. Uh, so we are just bringing this forth to basically 
you know, mirror what the, what the city has done. So again, that we're even across the board and across the county. My apologies to you, but I should have asked you for explanation to begin with. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, questions, comments? Um, Supervisor Coffee. Just one clarification in section 5B, it says um, transaction fee of 5,000 per year billed quarterly shall be charged to each pawnbroker pawn billed quarterly. I don't think we need to have billed quarterly on there twice. So I would, I would move to pass this um, and take out one of the billed quarterly statements. I think to make a correction like that, you'd have to make a motion to amend. Oh, okay. I believe. Hey. Yes? We're checking. Okay. Thank you. Section 5. Yeah. Yeah. So Does the member make a motion to amend? Yeah. I would make a motion to amend and take out one of the build quarterly. Would you indicate which one? Comments. To be clear. I, I think it might read more carefully clearly if we took out the one that said um, $5,000 per year and then drop out that billed quarterly and then put it at the end, each pawnbroker um, billed quarterly. You have it? Oh, okay. All right. Thank you very much. Do we have a second for that amendment? Second by Supervisor Boardwoman. Uh, any discussion or questions about the amendment? Supervisors, please take your keypads in hand and vote on the amendment. <coughs> Supervisor Coffee, there we go. Get, get it to work. <laughs> there we go. I'm sorry, it's unanimous, 27. Thank you. Uh, so we are now back to the main motion. Uh, and this is on file 97. Question, uh, as amended, excuse me. Uh, any uh, questions, comments, discussion? I see none. Supervisors, please take your keypads in hand and vote. You are voting on file number 97 as amended. That is 27, yes, it is unanimous. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is file number 116. I believe, right? Amending the 1982 official zoning district boundary map for the town of Brunswick. Uh, we are taking action on this this evening. A motion. Supervisor Leary, was that a second? Supervisor Beckfield. Supervisor Beckfield. Explanation, Supervisor Gibson. Thank you. Oh, sorry. You're on. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> this uh, is a little different. This is the first time we've had this situation in Eau Claire County. Um, Non-metallic mining falls under zoning, but this actually isn't a rezone. Um, previously, it was mined to remove all the sand and stuff and was reclaimed like years ago and now there's a new owner and because of the river being so close there you know with the back flooding and everything else it's a lot of sand is filled back in there so as far as the whole non-metallic mining process this is only the first part of it which is just to approve an overlay which describes the different phases and what they're going to do for this project um, after once this is approved then they you know, for each phase, they'll have to get permits and everything for each phase before they can even start on those two, which have to be approved. But um, the town of Brunswick um, recommended approval by a two to nothing vote. Um, Planning and Development has reviewed this with county code and recommended approval. And this came to the Planning and Development Committee and we recommended approval of this. Thank you. Are there any questions? Is there any discussion of this item? I see, you know, oh, sorry, Supervisor Stelchus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Uh, I, I do have a couple questions and, and a few comments on this, uh, and maybe I see P and D staff could help answer this. Uh, just going back, there was several months ago that some property similar to this or, or adjacent to this was up in front of us. And uh, at that time, I mentioned, I just remind people that at one point in time, the county stewardship program looked at this property to acquire this from Hunsinger, who was the previous owner, uh, for recreational property because the, the state trail goes through that. But that, uh, that effort uh, failed for uh, lack of taking time and probably lack of getting enough partners together. But still, there was a strong desire to ultimately see what could be done with this property uh, from a recreational standpoint. Now, I do understand that it's been previously mined, and so uh, you know it, it probably is, is appropriate that it continue to be mined. So I guess I, on principle, I'm not opposed to that. But a couple questions uh, for staff. Has this ever been considered navigable water? I know that there is some flow that goes through that. And so does that come into play at all? I mean, can people mine navigable waterways? Without objection, I'll ask uh, Mr. Esslinger or Mr. Michaels to respond. Could you come up to one of the microphones? Borrow someone's microphone there. Oh, that's not going to work. Um, I, I need a different converter. Um, uh, just to explain the, the question, um, Cooley Lake is uh, contains um, uh, is contained within the in the property itself, and uh, there that portion of the property is navigable. Um, but most of what uh, the applicant is proposing to do or to mine is, is part of the over, uh, old uh, mine area, um, and that would be considered not part of the navigable waters of the state. But, so the parts, but I, I guess that's what got my attention is that parts of Cooley Lake itself are included in the periphery of this section. So is that, I mean, is that allowable to mine in navigable waters? That would be covered under the uh, Department of Natural Resources Authority. Um, if they do dredging um, in those those waters, um, that would require a Chapter 30, uh, 3, 3, 3, 340 permit, and that would be required um, for the applicant to submit the necessary paperwork and, and permits through the through the state of Wisconsin. So they would be um, responsible for that. As we understand, um, so the action tonight is really just looking at um, the overlay district to see if, if this is appropriate for a large scale mining operation, which is defined by an ordinance more larger than 10 acres to move forward through the process. As Supervisor Gibson has indicated, this is one of the first steps to allow the applicant to make application um, for a, a non-metallic mining operation permit. It's a conditional use permit, um, which will be more public um, hearings on that in front of the Planning and Development Committee. And also the, for the submittal of a rec uh, reclamation plan um, to show how the site once post, you know, once the site is mined, what is it going to look like after the, the, the mining is, is taken place. Um, so, it sorry. is really a two-part, it is really a two-part mine. Um, it's the mine that is above the water. Rod, to the mic. You can just tell me. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Usually I talk. <laughs> usually I, I talk loud enough where you, where you you can hear me. But um, so it's a two part. Um, this once if we get to that stage, um, the first part would be the county authority, which would be above the water. The second part, if we do mining into into the into the water. Um, that would require um, the Department of Natural Resource approval. Okay, and as, as far as you know, those approvals do not exist today yet. Have maybe not even applied for yet. I, I would I would say that's a fair statement. That's correct. Okay, and the decisions, further decisions by the county, will come back to this board. 
Further decisions um, will not come back. Um, it'll be a conditional use permit uh, for the operation standpoint of, of the site, which will be considered by the Planning and Development Committee under, the, under their purview. And then secondarily, the administrative part will be the reclamation um, of the uh, reclamation plan and, and approval, uh, which would be more administrative through the, uh, through the Planning and Development Department. Okay. Uh, second question then relates uh, to the... Uh, Supervisor Pagonis, was your question relevant to the first question? Um, my question is about the trail, so no. Okay, sorry. Um, the depth, I, I noticed that in some spots it says it would be mined uh, to within uh, one foot of the ordinary high water mark. And if I'm, was that the above ground parts that that refers to, or is that dredging below or to within one foot of the river level that's adjacent to it. I was confused about that on some of the um, drawings. Maybe I, you could just elaborate I, on I, that. It's my understanding it would be one foot of, of the existing um, water level that's, that's there. Um, and keep in mind, uh, back in 2012 when the county had uh, placed a moratorium on, on mining activities, just about the, the, uh, the start of frack sand mining in, in west central Wisconsin, um, the county at the time, we spent six months and, and we really looked at um, groundwater and mining into those, those areas. Um, we placed standards and, and restrictions in the code um, that requires hydro, uh, hydrogeologists to submit reports about groundwater, the movement of the groundwater. So there's going to be, you know, that next phase we'll have to we'll have to be taking those matters into consideration. So, but to answer your specific question, it is what is being proposed that staff understands at this point would be above the above the groundwater or above the. Uh, above the water level that's there. So now. it would be surface mining to within one foot of where the existing ordinary high water mark is on those water bodies? Uh, yes. Okay. So, uh, but then back to what Supervisor Gibson said, they were essentially, I took that to mean that they were cleaning out the ponds that had filled in because that area does flood and I do understand that it could wash back in and fill those so it's it's not just cleaning out these ponds um, staff understands that it would be uh, more along the lines of a, of a two part uh, one part is going to be um, more mining um, in the area that is considered upland and then the other part uh, would be more of a restoration part uh, maybe perhaps some dredging through department of natural resources approval in the uh, old water body that would be considered Cooley lake um, if you look on the aerial maps, you'll see that um, the two water bodies that are, are in, in, the, in this area are divided by a very narrow uh, band right. of, of wooded area, uh, maybe 15 feet, 20 feet wide. That really separates those two water bodies. Um, one is the old mine site that goes, that dates back years and years and years, and the other part would be the old oxbow, whoops, right. the old oxbow that, that sits there. Okay, so, uh, you know, as I said before, I, I'm not opposed to doing this uh, because it's been a mine before, but I still think in the public interest, uh, when we're done with this, uh, there's still a great opportunity for public recreation, and it's, it also, uh, you know, we could further enhance the benefits that the Chippewa River Trail provides, so I'd like uh, staff to work with the owner of this in the reclamation plan to see that we uh, do the best we can to enhance that property and even consider uh, uh, that, uh, you know, the, the owner and the gentleman's name escapes me right now, uh, would consider a public access agreement uh, as part of a recreation plan when we're done so that other people could enjoy this, which they heretofore have done with uh, permission from previous owners and so on. So I'd like to see us work toward that. Thank you. Supervisor Pagonis. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question about the um, uh, Chippewa River State Trail that appears to bisect this, this property. Um, I'm guessing that it wasn't there when it was previously mined back in the 60s. So um, it, it would seem to me that the trail is is public land and so there was going to be a um, some type of right-of-way over the trail 
And one of the provisions in the packet indicated that um, the, uh, there had to be an, uh, the, the owner had to provide um, to make sure that there would, be an un there would not be an unreasonable burden on local government. Uh, Mr. Jerzyk did say that the one crossing that it was, he had, there was concrete laid. Is that the only place that the, I'm assuming heavy equipment will be going back and forth if it's being mined, is that the only one spot that there will be heavy equipment? That is, that staff's understanding of, of um, and that would be an agreement because this is a, a state DNR trail, it's a, a paid trail. Um, the applicant has worked with the, um, with the Department of Natural Resources and their staff, and I believe it's already signed. Um, that's my understanding. Agreement? Yes. Sign. So, um, so it's. Uh, I see. It's a state trail, but then it's just the one piece, and no other aspect of the trail is at risk of being disturbed. Um, if I recall right from the uh, planning and development committee meeting, it was indicated that there's going to be uh, the applicant is going to be maintaining a, a 50 foot buffer on on either side of the. The actual paved trail as it is today. That's what he, he said. Fifty-five feet on each side feet. with grass. It's grass and treed already. That's yes. what he said. Yep. So that would continue, even though that's his property. That's. Um, the fifty-five feet is. The. As far as it, it's staff's understanding, that it would be maintained the the buffer on on either side of the uh, of the trail. Um, would be maintained by whom? With the, with the buffer. Jared, do you have, have more on, on that part of it? Um, I believe the, the owner would maintain that buffer. Yeah. And then just a follow-up question. It is, given that this is um, a, a, a lake, um, is, is there any type of wetland um, ordinances that would apply to this? Is it, it, it didn't, I didn't see anything about it. In the in, in specifically in Mr. Jerzyk's property, I don't know about outside of that. Um, as far as where where the wetlands are, floodplain. Um, this property is all in the floodplain. Um, there um, would be areas of, of you know wetland vegetation that would be identified in this area as well. Um, those are all all matters that we will have to take into consideration as we when we go to actual permit you know when the designs come in for the for the mining of it and where the overburden is going to be placed um, what it's going to look like for for reclamation um, at this point we don't have all those fine details because this is like i said this is the one you know the first first application or the first step in the in the process has staff had the opportunity to review the dnr agreement does it does has the dnr been in involved in the wetland aspect of it and, and um, let me I'll speak to this too because if you notice in here this whole thing this we're talking right now just an overlay which shows phase one phase two phase three phase four I saw okay? that. phase four is when it gets to the point of the lake there I guess you could call it okay so nothing will be addressed or permitted until they get to phase four. Once they get to phase four, as Rod had mentioned, is before they can do anything there, that would have to be permitted by the DNR. So at this point in time, we don't know anything. Well, we have, uh, staff has been um, on site uh, and along with the Department of Natural Resources, David Hahn. So, um, so we've been, I mean, there's, we've had boots on the ground, feet, you know, we've been on the property. So it, it's, it's the next step that we have to get into all the details that you're, you're really wanting to, to know at, at this point. I think Supervisor Denning had a question. Dunning. Yes, I was wondering, uh, I think that trail as I recall, was originally a railroad line mm -hmm. and was there long before the mines were. So when that was transferred to the DNR or to the Trail Association, we should have a determination of what width was there. So that would have to be maintained under any circumstance. Thank you. 
Supervisor Beckfield. Um, the owner of the property I know has owned that property a long time and been a very uh, good steward of that property. I know of no issues from him. The other thing I want to say about it is that this is just a permit to get the permit to basically get the ball rolling. And so it would have to come back through the DNR and everybody else. Because a lot of these questions that are being answered or asked tonight are in phase three and four. So all he's trying to do tonight is get permission from us to move forward from phase one or into phase one so he can move into phase two, three, and four. Am I, am I accurate in that statement? Yeah, so, so exactly. So we're, we're looking at the overlay district to allow the applicant to have a, have a mine site essentially larger than 10 acres. Okay. Um, and then the next step is the, the permitting of the, the operational part of it and then also the reclamation um, permit. So I think it may help if we, if we back up just one bit, and I, I should have started by this, is that when we looked at the moratorium, the non-metallic mining reclamation moratorium back in 2012, one of the things that we wanted that came out of that is the moratorium and the creation of the overlay district in and of itself, it allowed the towns the ability to give input to say yes or no with the larger mine sites in the county. Because at that point, think back to these large sites were, were a couple hundred acres, and the towns only had the ability to look at, at, at the time, just as a conditional use permit. So what you're saying at this point is that they've already approved that part of it, correct? Yeah. That's Therefore, right. we're the, asking the, us to allow them to move forward to do the application. So the town supported things. this particular correct. Yep. Thank you for the clarification Thank about you. the motion. I, I see four persons indicating wish to speak, and I'm going to ask each one if your question or comment is relevant to the motion tonight, which is regarding the overlay. So I'll begin with Supervisor Stelches. Is it relevant to the? Uh, well, I, <laughs> to, to me it is First a little bit. It's just a, a quick question. Do we have any idea how long this mining process is intended the stages? for? Are you talking about the stages? Um, the what? The stages. Yes. I mean, are we talking a three-year thing or a 50-year in that range? Do we have any sense for that? Um, Maybe we don't. I don't know. Uh, it, it, my recollection from the, uh, from the committee meeting, we were talking about 25, 25 years to get down yeah, to right. the, uh, that one foot above the, the groundwater, to my understanding. OK, thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Moritz, is your question relevant to the overlay? My question is relevant to the two people who spoke in public uh, earlier. Whether it's relevant to the overlay or not, I don't know. I'm going to ask you to confine it to the motion, which is regarding the overlay in the interest of clarity and, and time. I cannot answer the question. I don't understand it. I only understand my question. <laughs> I don't understand the definition of overlay. No, that's that's relevant to the question. <laughs> so you want the definition of overlay? No, I want to ask my question based on what the two individuals spoke on earlier when they spoke in public comment. I have a that question was, about that. Uh, proceed with your question, but okay. let's do it now, in the If the owner maintains the buffer, are there enough trees there mm -hmm. now in the in this buffer zone? to meet the satisfaction of the trail group? To answer your question, that's not relevant to the overlay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Supervisor DeLuca, relevant to the overlay? I believe so. You believe so? Yes. Please proceed. Um, I guess uh, I, I'm hearing from some of the county board members that were not sure exactly how the process is. Um, so you're asking for the permit to get started. If we say yes, and it goes forward. Permit. Okay, well, I mean, a process, a resolution to get started so he could get this permit to get moving. Um, if we say yes tonight, none of this will ever come back to the county board again. Is that correct? Uh, it, we, so, so the overlay allows them to go forward with making an application for a conditional use permit, okay. which will go back, which will be made by the applicant and heard and reviewed at a public hearing in front of the Committee on Planning and Development. The Committee on Planning and Development has the final say for 
approval or, or denial with a conditional use permit. It will not come back in front of the county board. The other permit that they'll need, well, there are a couple of permits that they'll need, is the reclamation permit. That's what it's going to look like when the mining is complete. That is an administrative permit that is um, reviewed and approved through the Planning and Development Department. Okay, there's a team of staff, and, and we also partner up with the, uh, uh, with the Health Department as well. The other permits that will be uh, looked at as well is erosion control and stormwater will be on top of, of those permits as well to make sure that um, we have the best management practices in, in place. Um, those are the permitting, that's, that would be the next, next step. So this is, this is not a permit tonight. This is an approval by the county board. It functions very much like a rezoning change um, that you're changing it from, you know, uh, egg to a residential district. In this particular case, with an overlay, the general zoning district stays, there's no change to that, but the overlay, what this does, is allows for mining to occur where it's going to be larger than 10 acres in size. Over the life of the mine, that overlay district will stay in place until the site has received a certificate of compliance with the reclamation plan. So after they're done mining, our officers are required to go out there to look at the site to make sure that they complied with the reclamation plan. And then at that point, we can sign off, release the financial assurances, and then at that point when we release that or sign that certificate of compliance, the overlay district essentially goes away. So you can kind of think of it as a, as a temporary holding place. Um, because of the intensity of, of mining activities, um, specifically the industrial sands, um, when we were talking about this originally back in 2012, and for some of the committee members that were, were on the planning and development, you can think back and... and that's what we struggle with uh, is, is that these sites are, are very large, they're very intensive, they're 24-7 uh, truck traffic. Now, albeit that this is more of a sand and gravel operation, which is probably not going to be as, as intensive, um, it's still the provision that, that we had moving forward. And we wanted to make sure that at the time we applied it equally across, across the board. Thank you. I don't know if that helps. So so, um, okay, I understand. Every phase then, um, they will have to come back to P&D for information, or they just only permit. come back for phase Each four, phase which is reclamation. Excuse me. So, it, it's a, that's a good question. Um, so, as far as how the, the sites are, are generally permitted, um, we would look at um, a permit on the entire property and they may the operator may choose to operate in in phases um, so in in full disclosure at the public hearing the applicant will say here is my mining plan for the property so everybody understands what that mining plan would be everybody has an opportunity to to look at it comment on it um, the committee has an opportunity to digest it staff has the ability to look at the whole picture okay the, the large scan and then um, it can be approved uh, subject to those, you know, phases being implemented along the lines. Not necessarily would that go back to the committee unless the committee specifically requests that, you know, um, phase one come back, you visit, you know, you come back every two years or every three years. Generally, they won't do that. That would be more of an administrative responsibility for, for staff to, uh, to oversee. All right. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Knight, relevant to the overlay issue? Um, well, you can let me ask my question and you can weigh in on that. Okay. <laughs> I'll give it a shot. Uh, Please go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I'm on planning and development. As you know, we had a long discussion and had several people come to speak uh, pro and con on this. Um, I had my initial, uh, I had severe initial concerns about going into the bed of a natural lake, which had not been previously mined, as would happen in phase four. The applicant tells us that uh, he's going to make uh, no money on that. He sees that as a uh, restoration project for wildlife. And we had a fellow turn up at the meeting saying, hey, I used to fish there as a kid. Uh, the lake's filled in now. 
We also had a biologist show up who said, hey, that's what happens at Cooley Lakes. They, they fill up over time, although that process has been accelerated by uses upshed in the Chippewa watershed. So, um, I have to say that your question is not relevant to the overlay. Okay, then I won't <laughs> ask it. <laughs> Sorry. Point of order? Please. What's your point? Uh, well, it's just that, I think, Chair, Mr. Chair, you're trying to focus this on the overlay, and I recognize that, but the overlay represents the initial step of a process, and I think that we as County Board Supervisors, we're not going to hear this again. This is it. So I think that we, are, we have an obligation to get the information we need. I agree partially with your point of order. Um, if the discussion is clarification, as Supervisor Lawrence was seeking, I believe, about the meaning of the overlay and the stages and so on and what's involved, that, that's fine. But as to processing any of the stages, that's not relevant. Well, and what I heard Supervisor Knight about to talk about was that, I mean, he sat in on P&D and he's heard some of the other discussion that we have not been privy to. And I, I think he's imparting valuable information. You could request that as a point of information. That's correct. Well, I think the chair should allow Supervisor Knight to continue his question. I just did. Okay. Is there more, Supervisor Knight? Do you want me to ask you another question then? No, no. <laughs> I'm not inviting more. But maybe fascinating, <laughs> equally fascinating? I, what I'm trying to avoid is, is uh, doing the whole process here on the county board floor tonight. That's what I'm trying to avoid in the interest of clarity and time and so on. I take Supervisor Pagonis's point. Um, if there is anything else that's relevant to her point, please ask it, otherwise. Do I have other information to impart on this Cooley Lake? I'm not sure what door I'm opening there, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, this is all 15 years in the future, but um, normally I don't like messing around with the lake bed of a, of a, of a navigable lake. Well, apparently, um, as, it, as phase four is designed, it would leave wetlands untouched at either end of the Cooley Lake, where apparently the wetlands are. Um, it would take out a bunch of, some muck that is filled in over the years and make it deeper for, for a fishing hole. And um, he said to us and he said uh, the town of Brunswick was especially interested in this that there will be public access I know Supervisor Stull just talked about having a recreation area and he also mentioned on the other former gravel pits he'd be dredging he also mentioned habitat that right now they're basically bowls with water in them if you contoured the bottom a little differently when you're done you can make them better for fish and wildlife um, so that kind of swayed me and one other factor was um, I, I asked if it could be cut off, the Cooley Lake could be cut off like previous dredging was where they didn't touch the natural Oxbow Lake, they just dug holes elsewhere. And there's now some connecting channels in a couple places between the, uh, the gravel pit lake and the natural Cooley Lake. And the DNR wants those there, they want that exchange of water, so they're, they're hydrologically connected, the DNR wants it that way. At that point I said, go ahead and do the overlay. Voted in favor. Thank you for your point of information. I. Sorry. Wasn't a question to the overlay though. That was good. Okay, Thank you. It was good. <laughs> I'm sorry, I missed all that. I see no other um, uh, supervisors indicating a wish to speak. Therefore, I am going to ask you to take your keypads in hand and vote on file 116. We have 24 yes and three no. Uh, the, the motion passes. Thank you. The next file is file 105. Amending the 1982 official zoning district boundary map for the town of Washington. Uh, motion. Supervisor Beckfield. Second, Supervisor Chilson. Explanation, uh, Supervisor Gibson. Yes? Yes. Okay. 
Okay, this request is to rezone six acres of land from AP Agriculture. Excuse me, Supervisor Gibson, I don't think we can hear you. This is on. <laughs> it's on, but <laughs> please speak. Uh, do you want to make it up here like this? <laughs> A little, a little overkill. Okay. <laughs> All right. This is to rezone six acres of land from AP Agriculture District to A2 Residential to create additional lot for development of a single family resident for a family member. Um, this was looked at by the uh, Town of Washington and was voted 4 0 to approve. It was reviewed. All the code and everything was reviewed by Planning and Development. They recommended approval of this. This came to Planning and Development for public hearing, and we voted uh, and recommended approval of this also. And then also to let you know is the remainder of this property will continue to stay in agriculture. Thank you. Are there any questions or is there any discussion regarding this motion? Oh, Supervisor Stelchis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, presentation that was done earlier this evening about revamping some of our zoning codes, maybe it touched on this, but it seems like we do an awful lot of these rezones where someone wants to build a house on the family farm. So is I, I sense that maybe that was one of the things that was being reconsidered in a new uh, ordinance. Is that, did I catch that correctly? Uh, where this might be avoided and not necessarily a rezone anymore? No. No? No. This will uh, still remain the same. And it'll still be reviewed Sorry. by planning and development <clears throat> as to how the code reads, which, you know. Well, wasn't there something in that presentation, though, about a combination ag residential? And I, uh, I was sensing objection. that that's where that was See, going. I can't, well, I can't answer that because Maybe it they're hasn't. not there yet. Okay, is that, is that where we're heading though? That's my question. Is your thought objection, Mr. Michaels apparently has a response. Quickly moving to the microphone. So, um, Matt Michaels, P and D. Um, excellent question and, yeah, Jason slipped out of here. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, they will be looking at a district called ACR, which is agriculturally compatible residential. Now, I would say the focus is going to be primarily in what we call non-farm residential. So in a case like this, this is, a, this is a family member coming back to live adjacent to their parents. So I don't think it would address that exactly. So in my mind, it's a little bit different scenario. What they're primarily uh, concerned with is perhaps folks who don't have any agricultural ties <clears throat> who would move back, you know, into farming areas and there would be incompatibilities there, so. Okay, so I, I, I guess one further comment. We, we continue to do, to talk about family members and I think that's a very short term view. You know, somebody will come back and, and build a parcel on what was family land, but that's not gonna stay, you know, somebody has the right to sell that mm -hmm. to anybody tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So I, when we, Bring these things forward. I, it might be information, but I don't think we should ever make these decisions based on the fact that it's family because it's mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be family. So that's just a comment. Thank you. Thanks. Done. Supervisor Chilson. Thank you. Um, hit my button to speak just because this is a hot button for me. Um, I think it is important to hear that it is a family member coming back as a part of the farmstead. Um, I think it's important that we encourage agriculture and the only way you're going to do that is to have family members that want to move back and I think that encourages not only that family but their uh, younger generations and encourages them to maybe take up that occupation as well. So I hope that this board in these future requests that this will come forward that it is a family member looking to come back because on my time in planning and development I found that to be a very important motivator when considering these decisions. And I think it's very important for this board to hear that and to consider that. Thank you. I see no other supervisor who wishes to speak. Therefore, uh, supervisors, please take your keypads in hand and vote on file 105.
Roger Moritz. Thank you. It is 27 to nothing. It is unanimous. Thank you. The last item on our agenda is file 115. Amending section 4.30.070 of the code, dog license tax. Uh, uh, motion. Supervisor Leary. Second, Supervisor Dunning. Speaking to it, I assume Supervisor Pagonis. Um, and actually, there's not much to say. I think that the fact sheet's pretty self-explanatory. We have not been recovering a sufficient amount to meet our contracts with the Humane Association, so we've had to supplement that. And so this is just to um, increase the license fees um, for dogs, and it's a modest amount. So I. We're hopeful that the increase will allow us to meet our obligation to the Humane Association. <coughs> Thank you. Are there any questions? Is there any discussion on this motion? I see no one. In the, oh, sorry. <coughs> Supervisor Knight. Question, do the townships tack on then that too? Because we paid a little more than $6 for our two neutered setters. I who weren't able to speak tonight. You can't. I don't. Well, <laughs> I don't uh, know the clerk, answer to that. But, but our clerk has a response to your question. Oh. It, it can be the town, village, or city that can add on to that. Correct. Okay. I, yeah. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak to this? Supervisors, please take your keypads at hand and vote on file one. One fifteen. Thank you. Supervisor Knight. That is 27 to nothing. It passes unanimously. Thank you very much. We have reached the end of our agenda. This meeting is adjourned. This program was brought to you by a cooperation between Newsworks and Eau Claire County. Newsworks is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, please contact us via phone at 715-839-5067 or online at valleymediaworks.org.